Hello, everybody. I am going to show you using, uh, show you how to use and at least get installed and get set up uh, Code for IBMI, which is a Visual Studio Code extension, which is completely free. It's also open source. The very first thing that you should do is probably download Visual Studio Code if you haven't got it already, although I assume most people do. You can just search Visual Studio Code into Chrome. It's usually the first result and you'll see it. It's available for Mac, Windows, and Linux. Um, yeah, really easy to install, takes a minute or so. It's really that simple. The second thing before we install the extension is to check that the SSHD is running, running or at least start it up. You can start it up on a 5250 emulator with um, STR, TCP, SVR, start TCP service. The prompt it and the option that you want or oh, server sorry the option that you want is just start sshd which is usually an option on here too yeah right there so you want to start the sshd um, which is just the ssh daemon you're going to need that because that's how um code for ibmi actually connects to um to the ibmi securely then of course when we have visual studio code running we can come and find the extension in the extensions tab, and you can just search for IBMI. And if we scroll to the bottom of this list, I see code for IBMI and also the uh, IBMI development pack. Now this actually just comes with the extension and a bunch of other uh, extensions, which you can use to help improve your development, or at least it just basically comes with more extensions targeted for IBMI development. Nonetheless, I'm for now, I'm just gonna get code for IBMI. So I can just click install. It really was that simple. Uh, it adds this new tab um, when, when, and when we hover over it, it says IBMI, we can click on that. You'll notice here that I already have some systems configured because uh, I have used it before, obviously, um, and it retains the configuration even though I uninstalled the extension before. Now I'm gonna go ahead and create a new server, a new connection here. You can do that with this plus button and it opens up this little tab over here. So you can give it a name, I'm just gonna call it YouTube. And I'm going to put in the host name or the IP address. So in my case, that's mine. That's going to be your SSH port. So for example, if you're using Pub 400, uh, the SSH port is 2222, 2222. Um, and I have a username, obviously. Now, uh, you can actually use a password or a private key. You don't use both. You use one or the other. Um, so, in the, But for this case, um, I'm actually just going to use a password. So I'm gonna type my password in and then you just click connect and that's really all you do. Um, and it, it does the work and that's it. You've connected, um, you, the way that you'll know that you're connected is because um, if you look down here in the bottom left, you'll see the settings um, button appear and also this actions button. Um, now we're gonna talk about the settings because of course the very first thing you should do is configure your setup for the connection. So if you just click it, it actually opens up this new tab here and it lets you put in some some details so for example you can specify a temporary library that is not qtemp and this is where Islander, sorry this, this is where code for ibmi actually puts um, temporary data that it generates um, and the reason it's Islander by default is because this is the same mechanism that we used in that product at the time and we just never changed it so I would recommend that if you have multiple users connecting to the system using Code for IBM is that they all use the same temporary library. Um, you'll actually notice that um, if the library uh, doesn't exist, it will actually create it for you. So if I look for this library, um, so you'll see that it's created this, it, this actually created itself when I connect to the system, it checks that it exists. And if I do a fire, you can see here, um, what the objects are in it, but I'm actually looking to do uh, an eight because I wanted to show you what the description was. It says code for I, um, temporary objects may be cleared, but that's because the objects in this library aren't that important, or at least the files aren't. Then there's also the enable SQL option, and it will be enabled by default if db2util is installed. So um, code for IBMI uses db2util to talk to the system uh, when when uh, SQL is enabled. So whenever Code Rhyme or runs SQL statements, it will use db2util. Now it's not a required thing to be enabled, but it is enabled by default um, 
anyway. The next one is uh, source ASP, which is blank by default. Um, you don't actually have to worry about this one so much unless you have um, SQL disabled. So you can ignore this if you have access to QSYS2 AS ASP info, because of course some people, for some reason, put source code in an ASP other than the base. Um, and that's totally fine, um, but you can, if you don't have uh, DB2 enabled, you can, or SQL enabled, you can put in the source ASP that you're working with. Now this one is a funny one. If you have a source file that is in 65535 and you need to override um, so, for example, if, if the source file is 65535, you actually can specify um, what CCS ID you want it to force it to use. So, most people would put, you know, 280 or 37 in here, but you can just leave it a star file. You don't need to change it. Um, I would recommend that you keep star file. Errors to ignore, I'm not going to cover right now. It's not particularly important. But the last three are quite important. So um, if you're a heavy source member user and you love your source dates, then you probably want to go ahead and, and enable source dates, um, which is fine. Um, SQL is enabled for source dates, is required. I'm sorry, SQL is required for source dates. So you have, must have SQL enabled. And you can also choose where it's going to show up. So I like to have it in the bar. We'll talk about that later. And then lastly, you can do enable CL content assist. And I'm going to go ahead um, and put that on as well. So I'm going to save. And it's going to say some settings require a restart to take effect. Would you like to reload the workspace? You can reload. And then you can just connect to the system again. Easy peasy. Now we can go ahead and start actually looking at some code. So um, here's my green screen. And I'm just going to check what objects I have in here. Actually, all that start with Q. That are files. So I have a few COBOL source, DDS, QRPG LE source. Those are the kind of main few. So let me go ahead and get these loaded up in here. So you can click the, uh, the little plus folder, the, uh, the folder with a plus on it in the member browser. And I can say Barry Q uh, CVB LE source. I can also do Barry Q RPG. Oh, actually, let's do QDDS source. Let's do uh, Barry Q RPG LE source. And of course, the last one, uh, Barry Q RPG LE ref. So now I have the Barry folder that shows up and I can see all of my four uh, source files inside of it. I can open these, click on a source member and have them actually open up. Now notice here that um, there's no syntax highlighting for this, which is quite strange, but you can tell VS Code to associate and I apparently uh, don't have COBOL syntax installed right now, which is not like me to have that. So there is actually extensions for that, but I'll cover that another time. We actually just want RPG for now. So let's look at a uh, code test here. So of course I actually have some source code and you'll notice um, that it's pretty basic. I mean, it's just a regular program. It's a very stupid program. So let me just get rid of some some pieces here. And uh, when you first launch, uh, you may be wondering how to compile code. Well, you can use a shortcut on Windows. It's control. I guess Windows and Linux, it's control E on a Mac. It's command E. Pressing it will show you the available actions for this type of member and uh, and source type. So RPG LE in this case, and I can run create bound RPG on my source code here. That was really easy. Now, let's just create an intentional error just to show you that it's actually um, an issue. If I try and do something like display var too long, and of course try and compile that, that's actually an error because var too long is, is way too long. It's, you know, display only allows a maximum of 52 characters and var too long is 100, so the error shows up right there in, um, in the editor, which is really cool. So I can just make that change and do that as well. Now, I'll just cover one last topic for you. Usually when you connect to a system, uh, the library list will be inherited. Um, but in my case, I actually don't have a library list set up on, uh, as part of my user profile or a job description. So um, I don't really have a library list full of libraries, but um, I can add some. I can use the add to library list button and I can add a couple. So if I want to add Barry, 
I may also want to add uh, sample. I may also want to add CMV sys. There we go. And of course, I can move these up and down too. So I may want a company sys to be quite at the top. I'm also able to change my current library. So I can use this other button next to it that says change current library. Default is QGPL. I'll just leave that for now. Um, and so you can manage your library list with this. Now, I have another example here that actually uses a copy book. So um, this actually points to QRPG LA source boop one, which is quite a fun name. So let me open boop one right here. So there's boop one, which is a great name. And that just actually adds print F that has the print F um, procedure. So it's, it's a prototype. Now what this actually belongs in Barry. So let me take out this from the library list and try and compile code test two. You'll actually see that it failed. Um, if I hover over this, it says the compiler is not able to open it. Um, so that's fine. The same with the printf, you know, the name is not defined. And that's because it can't find this copy book. And that's because Barry is not on the library list. So let me add it back here, recompile the program again. And you'll see that it was successful that time. We have a nice um, warning message because it, you know, it has a value, but it's not returned. So that's really easy. Now you may be wondering, I, I think I'll explain this last piece. If you have a magnitude of errors when you compile programs, you'll actually find all of the errors for the, for you know, all of the compile errors in the bottom left. So these red lines or the blue lines actually come from the error panel, which you can bring up by hovering your mouse over here on the, uh, in the bottom left. If you click on it, it opens up the problems tab and you can actually click through the errors here, which is really cool. And I think that's pretty much the basics that you need to know for Codefire RBMI to make a start. Um, yeah, I hope you check it out. Thanks, um, thanks a bunch for actually having a look. And yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing what people think about it. So yeah, thanks.